Good morning to each of you this morning. It's good seeing you out. And uh, I want to just say a word of thank you to the praise team, Kathy, Gary, and uh, Ellen. Amen. It was good. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I've been amazed this morning as uh, we already enjoyed our, enjoyed our Sunday school hour. I thought for a minute our team must have looked at my notes as he opened the uh, Sunday school hour. And then as we watched the brief video that we had this morning, it just fits right in talking about the holiness of God and his creation. It was just awesome. And uh, uh, Gary, the selection of Psalm this morning, it all tied together. I just praise God for what, he's do uh, for what he did this morning and how He's prepared our hearts as we look at uh, Psalm chapter 8. But before we look at Psalm 8, let's just bow for a word of prayer, asking God to speak to each one of our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, <clears throat> we just want to praise you, first of all, for who you are and for what you've done for each one of us. And as we think over this past week, Father, I pray that you would just remove all the challenges that we faced from our minds and that we will be able to focus on your word. And Father, we also think of this coming week that's before us. And Father, I pray that those concerns would also be removed and that we'll be able to focus on what your word has for us. And so Father, we want to just ask you to meet the needs of each one of our hearts and that your name would just be lifted up this morning, that we would just be encouraged from your word. Father, we thank you for what you are going to do and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. As we look at Psalm 8 and the title of the sermon is A Natural Question. We'll see it shortly as we look at, uh, at Psalm chapter 8, but Psalm 8 is the first uh, uh, psalm of praise in the, in the book of Psalm, and, uh, and it is a magnificent uh, psalm as we think of it. And uh, some refer to it as a psalm for stargazers, because it does talk about God's creation and all that he has done. But it is far more than a psalm for stargazers. It is a psalm for soul searchers. As we look at the book of Psalms this morning, I trust that each one of us will ask the question, God, what do you want me to do and how do you want me to see you? It is a psalm that will challenge, uh, that challenges our hearts. It is a psalm about God and our relationship to Him. And He desires to have a close relationship with each one of us. That's why He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross of Calvary, that He might redeem us, and that He might draw us into a very close relationship with Him. The chief purpose of man on the, on the earth today is to bring honor and glory to our holy God. And I trust that as we look at the Psalms this morning, that, that, we'll, it, that it will enable us to truly give him the glory that he desires. And so as I said, it is a psalm about God and our personal relationship to him. And then as you look at the book of Psalm, you cannot uh, read uh, Psalm 8 without thinking about Genesis chapters uh, 1 and 2. And I just want to point out, before I get into the message, a couple of verses from Genesis chapter 1. If you notice uh, verse 3, and notice what it says, and God said, verse uh, 6, and God said, and these things came into being. And then verse 9 again, and God said, at uh, verse 14, and God said, and he created the, the earth by his voice, by his saying. Verse 20, again, and God said. Verse 24, and God said. God created 
to the world by his spoken word. And I'm sure that as the psalmist wrote chapter 8, he was probably thinking about some of these things, about the greatness of God and his glory. And so as we look at the uh, first uh, verse, or the first, I'm going to look at the first four, word, uh, four verses, and it deals with the question of human worth. And as the psalmist started out here, he spoke, O Lord, our Lord. That phrase is a, is a powerful phrase as you stop and think about it. The word Lord, it means master. It means someone who's in absolute control, someone who's in charge. Someone who has the final word, absolute authority. That's what is wrapped up in the word Lord. Someone who is in control. And then notice what David says right after that. He says, our Lord. And so as you think of what the word Lord means, the question is brought to the surface of, are we really responding to him as our Lord, Lord who's in control of every aspect of our lives. Sometimes when the problems of the, uh, that we face from week to week come rolling in, we begin to shudder. But any of those problems that we face, are they too big for someone who is in absolute control, our Lord? You know, as we think of this, it makes some of the things of, of this world just kind of grow strangely dim. When we think of who God is and who he wants to be in our lives. And so as we uh, look at this, uh, at, at verse 1, there it says, Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord. And then he goes on to say, How majestic is your name in all the world. Earth. And as we think of this, the word uh, majestic, it is, the word majestic means indescribable, beyond our imagination. And our God is beyond description. Oh yes, we try with our feeble human attempts. But the majesty of God is far beyond our imagination. And I think this is what David, what David was probably thinking of here as he penned these words. How majestic is your name in all the earth. And as we think of that, he was thinking of more than just Israel. He was thinking of the entire expanse, expanse of the, of the world. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Not only in the nation of Israel, not only in our little realm, but it reaches far beyond. And as we look through the rest of the chapter, we realize that David included in, in, in his writing beyond the expanse of the heavens. And as we think of the heavens, we realize how great they are. And yet, uh, his majesty is far above all of that. Notice in the last part of verse 1, you have set your glory above the heavens. The glory of God is beyond measure. As we look at, uh, at the heavens and as we listen to, to science and as we read about these things, we realize that it is beyond human imagination. And the psalmist says, and God has set his glory above the heavens. You know, for us to comprehend the God that we worship is beyond our human capability. And what all David was thinking of here, I don't know. What was hitting him? What caused him to pen these words? But I'm sure he was, and I almost envisioned David sitting of an evening on top of the palace in an open form as uh, the culture of the land was. And I could just 
think of it and see him looking at the stars, the moon, and the firmament, and all the rest, he's probably sitting there thinking, God, your glory far exceeds all these things. From time to time, our minds are blown as we look at, uh, at uh, videos of what our scientific community has captured through telescopes and whatnot. We're amazed at what we see. But each new discovery that science discovers, the glory of God is far beyond that. And we need to keep that in mind. That is the God that you and I worship today. And then as we look at verse 2, it says, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the, the, the avenger. And as we look at, uh, at, at verse 2, he's, he talks here, uh, here about the... Uh, about the infants and all the rest, that the praise would, would be coming uh, from them. And as I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 and, uh, and 29, if we could have those up on the screen. You know, it speaks, uh, uh, the writer of Corinthians also uh, refers to, to this very fact in chapter 1. Verse 27, it reads, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And he chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Stop and think about that for a minute. God chose this glorious God whose glory is far beyond the heaven, but he chose the weak things of the world to make things happen. And then, as I think of his triumphal entry in Luke chapter 19, it also speaks uh, uh, of this, of his glory. And notice what Jesus himself said there in chapter 19, verse 40. I tell you, or rather I should start at verse 39, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you even you have only known on this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. But he says, if, these, if I would say to my followers to be quiet, he said, the very stones would cry out of, of my glory. And you know, as I think of this, and as I think back to my experience overseas, Created inside of every human being today, there's that desire to have a relationship with a supreme being. And many in the world today do not understand who that supreme being is. And that's what missions is all about. But, to, but many people today, they worship stones, sacred stones or sacred trees or whatever it might be. That desire for a supreme being being is in the heart of each believer. So Jesus said here, he says, if these people should be quiet, the very stones would cry out of my glory. And, uh, God's glory is uncontainable. If, if people refuse to bring glory to him, he will bring glory in some other way. But John Piper has said, that the chief purpose of man on this earth is to glorify God. You know, we have no other purpose. We have no other reason for living but to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. That's what our life is all about. 
And so as we think of, think of these of the things that uh, bring glory to God, I was thinking, even as I was preparing, think of Exabolus as God speak, as uh, the scriptures speak of the weak things, the small things of this earth that just make man stand back and praise to him. Think of the forming of a little baby in the womb. <coughs> And a baby that is so helpless when he's born. But that baby <clears throat> is an act of extreme glory to God when you think of the thousands and millions of nerve endings that are within the human body, all the intricate little things. And yet we see an infant as so helpless, absolutely unable to take care of himself. But God, in his glory, has glorified himself by that creation. God is worthy of praise and, and glory. And it has been said that out of these frail mater materials, God creates strength. There's a man by the name of Horn that has said, the praises of Messiah celebrated by the church, his children, have in them a strength and power which nothing can withstand. They can abash infidelity when at its greatest height and strike hell itself dumb. Absolutely. God in, in his glory, in the glory of his creation, it silences all arguments and, and all those things. And then also as we look at uh, at, at Matthew chapter 21, verse 15, when Jesus deals uh, with, with his accusers, and he quotes uh, some of these same, same verses here, Matthew chapter 21, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> Hosanna to the Son, I'm sorry. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you, not, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him, and Jesus replied, Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. And then notice, that's all he said. And then he, and he left them and well, went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. You know, in those verses, he pointed out who he is and who they were. That he is above all his glory. And as I was uh, thinking of this, we don't know what David was thinking about as he thinks as he was thinking of the glory of God, as he was sitting up on top of his palace in the cool of the evening, maybe he was reminiscing. Maybe he was thinking of his experience as a, as a shepherd boy when God enabled him to kill the bear and the lion. Or perhaps he was thinking about as, a, as coming from guarding the sheep and and walking up or seeing his brothers as they were facing the armies of the Philistines. And he said to, to Saul, I will go out and, and, and slay Goliath. Maybe he was thinking of that experience of a small shepherd boy killing the giant. I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking of. But he recognized that God is able. Or perhaps he was thinking about the great victories. You remember as he was uh, in later years and, and the cry of the people was David or Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousand. He was giving God the glory as we read through Psalm chapter 8 of his majesty and all that he accomplished. And so as we look, look on through the chapter here, verse 3, notice what he says here. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Notice how he talks about this, the work of your fingers. 
But you know, as I started this message and I read those verses from Genesis 1, he didn't even use his fingers, did he? It was by his spoken word. And David is just in awe here. And then, there comes that natural question in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? Have you ever stopped to think about this? What are we to God? We are his glorious creation. We are the people that he sent his son to die for on the cross of Calvary. He loved us. We are, we have priceless worth to him. And doesn't he deserve to be in control of our lives? He's created us. He has bought us that we should be to his glory and to his, his praise. And as we think of, uh, think of these verses that are before us here, he said, David says, when I think of the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man, my, man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You stop and think about his creation. And as science has revealed to us and told us that just traveling at the speed of light, it would take untold number of years to reach the end of his creation. And so here we are, little puny man, and he is concerned about each one of us. What is man that, that you are so mindful of us? However, David has not a question about God being mindful of us. He's, as we look at verse 5b, or the last part of it, and crowned him with glory and honor. Verse, uh, the first part of the verse, you made him a little more than the heavenly beings, just a little more than the angels at this time. But you have crowned man with glory and with honor. He has put us into a position in the world that is above everything else. A man by the name of Trapp said as he thinks about this, he says, man, a sorry, sickly man, a mass of, of uh, mortals, a map of miseries, a, a compound of dirt, sin, of dirt and sin, and yet God is mindful of him. If you stop and think about that phrase, that's awesome, isn't it? And then Spurgeon said, Satan is no doubt filled with scorn of man when he looks at him and measures himself. Is this the creator, creator or creature that is to be set over all of the works of God's hand, made of earth, and water, phosphates and metals. I'm nobler far than he. Can I not flash like lightning while he must creep about the world to find himself a grave? I think Spurgeon pretty well summed up what, what man is all about. Not so good. But we need to keep in mind, as verse 5 says, we are a little lower than the angels at the present time. But as we look at uh, Hebrews again, that's only for a time. In Hebrews chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 5 through 9, it reads, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come. Notice, it's not the angels that are in charge of the world about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is man? that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at the present 
we do not see anything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For the time being, a little lower than the angels, but when we stand in eternity, and when we praise God for what he has done for us, the angels will quietly fold their wings because they do not understand. They will not be able to understand redemption. But we will be able to praise him for what he has done for each one of us. At the present time, a little lower than the angels. But keep in mind, back in Genesis chapter 2, when God created us, he says, let us make man in our image. We are made in the image of God. We are precious in his sight. And sometimes we can be so hard on ourselves and we do, I can't do anything right. Things are always going wrong. But keep in mind, we are made in the image of God and we are precious in his sight. And then as we look at verses 6 through 8, notice what it says there. And you made him ruler over the works of your hands. Your, you put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Is there anything left in this creation that God has not put under the control of man. We are precious in the sight of God. Let's live as children of the king as we think of these things. And I'm sure that David, as he thought about this thing, he, he probably shouted out in praise within his heart and giving glory to God for what he has done for him and for each one of us. But as we look at Psalm 8, I think we see three important truths. God made man. God made man something glorious. And God made man for a high and worthy destination. For destiny. And so as the psalmist closes, verse, uh, I'm going to read verse 9, and with that I'm going to close as well. It says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our God is majestic, and he is the God that we worship today. I trust that as you look at the book of Psalms and as you face the challenges of this week before you, that you too will just bow in praise to God and say, God, how majestic you are. He is the God that we worship today, the God that is going to keep us through this coming week, no matter how difficult it is. God bless you. Father, we just give you praise for who you are, for what you have done for us, and for the glory that is yours because of what you have done. And Father, we just pray that each one of our hearts today will just give you the praise that is due to you. You are above the heavens. You are the God of gods. And Father, we praise you that you see fit to send your son to die on the cross for each one of us. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Les. You know, and as I've already mentioned, the Church of the Way Prayer List, but if you notice, the very top of this, it says church. So you pray, pray for your church. 